with you know with Shane McMahon coming back and him announcing that he wants control of Monday Night Raw, there's been rumors and reports running rampant that this is basically the indication that we might get a bl- a brand split. Now, in case some of you don't know and you're new to the product, WWE did a brand split back in 2002. Yeah, 2002. The reason they did a brand split is because originally, uh, the br- <coughs> excuse me, originally the brand split was going to be WWE WCW. <laughs> and from what I understand, WCW I believe was going to have Raw, maybe maybe rename it Nitro, just keep it Raw. I don't really know. And WWE was going to have SmackDown. Then again, it might have been WCW would have had SmackDown. WWE would have kept Raw. I don't know. Well, we all know what happened there. One match in Tacoma, or two matches in that area for two nights, definitely didn't do so well for for that venture. And whether or not Vince McMahon did that on purpose, according to people like Marcus Bagwell, Buff Bagwell, if you will, or not, I couldn't really say. However, with that being said, with that being said, uh, WWE decided after the invasion, I would say November, December, January, February, March, I say around March. April of 2002, essentially five months after the invasion ended, they went with a brand split. And of course, they had a draft. Now, the draft at first was just Vince McMahon and Ric Flair, because Ric Flair had surprisingly came in the night after the invasion angle ended, became co owners. And because of this, this uh, and because of this, Linda McMahon and Storyline decided, you know what, you guys can't work under the same under the same umbrella. You guys can't work, you know, uh, you know, underneath the same show, stuff like that. So guess what? You guys are going to be split. Uh, you guys are going to be split into two different areas. Basically, storyline-wise, Linda McMahon decided, hey, you guys can't get along under the same roof, the same building, so one of you is going to run Raw, the other is going to run SmackDown, and we're going to have a draft. And essentially what that draft did was send sitting stars over to different shows. Now, the first draft, of course, was basically, oh, I choose this person, oh, I choose that person, oh, I choose this and that. Now, the, I don't think there was a draft in 2003, as far as I know. Let me check for a second, folks. Like I was saying, basically, uh, as the years went on, things changed. Uh, basically, you know, like I said, with 2002, it was more like, well, I draft this person, I draft that person, da 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 well, the two th- well, they didn't have a draft in 2003 because I think they wanted to allow things to still kind of settle in and establish, you know, Raw and SmackDown as separate entities, separate promotions, if you will, within WWE. Well, in 2004, after WrestleMania 20, it was announced that we were going to get a new, uh, uh, we were well, not new, but we were going to get our first draft in about two years. And it was announced by Vince McMahon as a draft lottery. Now, basically, what this means, if you follow the NBA, if you follow the NBA, a draft lottery uh, basically consists of randomly picking out a number, or in this case, a superstar or diva. So basically, Eric Bischoff and Paul Heyman were the general managers of both Raw and SmackDown, and they initially picked out. Uh, the names of their uh, draft picks. Now, what was in, what was interesting about this, though, 
and this would be changed uh, later on, was you could actually, just like in real sports, like with the NFL and the NBA and Major League Baseball and stuff, you can actually trade stars on, that are currently on your roster for someone on the other roster. Long story short, what happened here from a storyline perspective is Triple H, who was the head heel, the top heel um, on Raw for the past year or so, Triple H uh, was drafted to SmackDown. And what happened, and what happened here was, storyline-wise, this did not sit well with Eric Bischoff, because now he just lost, not his world champion, but basically the guy that he favored the most. That basically he did... Well, basically the guy he favored the most, the guy that he valued more than anything in storyline. So from a storyline perspective, what happened was because he did not want to lose, he did, you know, because of the fact that he did not want to lose uh, Triple H, and due to the fact, from a storyline perspective, new general manager Kurt Angle <coughs> looked at it looked at it as Triple H cannot. Uh, from a storyline perspective, new general manager Kurt Angle basically feeling like it was Triple H's ego that would not allow him to coexist under the same banner as he, because when you think, because basically him and from a storyline perspective, him and Triple H were on and off rivals, uh, if you will. So basically, they couldn't exist. So basically, from a storyline perspective, him and Triple Kurt Angle basically looked at it like, hey, Triple H could not allow himself to be under the same banner as me, and especially taking orders from me. You know, stuff like that. His, his ego would not allow it. So storyline wise basically what happened was Eric Bischoff and Kurt Angle had put together a trade that sent, that sent Booker T and that was my computer uh, telling me about updates that right now I can't install because of gigabyte wise but anyway from a storyline perspective what happened was Eric Bischoff initialized initialized a trade that brought Triple H back to Raw and sent Booker T into Dudley's to Smackdown yeah. So that's what happened there. Now, the following year, though, things changed a little bit. Things were a little bit more different. Eric Bischoff was still the um, general manager of Raw, thus making him the longest running general manager um, in history. Sorry for that interruption. I had to let my dog out to go potty. <laughs> but anyway, like I said, uh, 2005 saw the the draft change up a little bit and, and change up a little bit into what was known as a draft lottery. Now, basically, um, it, like I was saying, the draft lottery. In case you follow the NBA, NHL, Major League Baseball, and, and such, uh, the draft lottery basically means you randomly pick. At you know, thanks to a tumbler. So, in the case of WWE, they were randomly picking superstars. Um, well, like I was saying, they were randomly picking superstars, ours, and all that. So, but the the difference about the two thousand five draft lottery though was it was random. But the thing was, it was done off screen. Now, it doesn't mean uh, that the draft just happened off screen and we didn't know who they, anybody was on the roster until like an, a following Raw SmackDown. No. Basically, uh, what, for one whole month, and this was in June of 2005, and I should know because I recorded it, recorded a majority of it on uh, 
um, on DVD. In fact, I in fact I I attended one of the I, I attended the SmackDown taping where they got the first draft lottery pick in in Kansas City. But anyway, like I was saying, um, uh, the difference was they nobody really knew who was going to be drafted until the general manager announced that draft pick. And uh, basically the draft lottery would happen off screen. Basically, according to the first draft lottery pick of 2005 for Raw, John Cena, the superstars would find out maybe by call or email or whatever saying, hey, you know, you've just been drafted over to, to Raw or you've been drafted to SmackDown. Now, from a storyline perspective, some might say, well, they probably just told them, okay, this is going to be your last SmackDown, your last Raw, and you're going to go over to this show, so be prepared. So, anyway, for the entire month, the landscape of WWE kind of changed in a big way. Some of the established SmackDown stars started showing up over on Raw. For example, John Cena was the first one. Carlito was the second one. No, uh, Kurt Angle was the second one. Carlito was the third. Big Show and RVD were the fourth and fifth. Now, take a look at that listing for Raw, who they got. Cena, Angle, Big Show, who was SmackDown mostly at the time, and Carlito, who had just burst on the scene about a year or, two, a year or so before. So, think about that. Two mainstays of SmackDown for about two and a half years. One up and coming Smack, or three mainstays of SmackDown for, well, two mainstays of, yeah, yeah, let me think, yeah. Three mainstays of SmackDown because Big Show somehow had drafted, went over to SmackDown or, or something. I'm not really sure what that entailed. I think he was part of a trade, I'm not really sure. Because, yeah. you know, Big Show went over there in 2002 as well, so I, I can't remember how that happened. I think it was part of a trade. Um, anyway, long story short, long story short, a lot of the bit SmackDown, a lot of the big SmackDown players went over to Raw. Well, a lot of the big Raw players, some of the big Raw players went over to SmackDown. Batista went to SmackDown. Part of it. Christian went to SmackDown. Uh, Chris Benoit went to SmackDown. Muhammad Hassan went to SmackDown. So basically, 2005 for a period really changed the landscape. Now, 2006 didn't really have much of a draft. It was just the only draft it was was two draft picks, and that was to help rebrand, to help put the relaunch of the WWE ECW brand on the map. Basically, Paul Heyman was able to get Kurt Angle and RVD. Now, as years went on, the draft would change up again. It, they would. So after basically one year of a whole month being dedicated to it, they went back to having it done in one night, mostly on Raw. Now, what happened, though, was unlike a draft, unlike, you know, a tumbler or just announcing who they had drafted, instead, matches would take in, would uh, matches took place. And most of the time, the final match of the night would culminate with a battle royal. Now, the thing about these matches was whoever won from their respective brand would gain that brand one or two draft picks and sometimes the person that lost the match would be the one that would get drafted as a matter of fact in 2007 when uh, in 2007 when Bobby Lashley beat Chris Benoit in a ECW Smackdown try uh uh into brand match to gain ECW draft pick, the draft pick was, well, of course, uh, 
the draft pick, of course, was Chris Benoit. Now, the same thing happened with The Miz and John Morrison. John Morrison, now Johnny Mundo. Uh, it happened to them. Miz had lost the match, and he ended up getting drafted to Raw from SmackDown, or from ECW. So basically, that's how it worked. And they kept this practice going. They kept this practice going for the next four years. For the next... Not just in... And they kept this practice going for the next four draft lotteries. They would. Even when it just went back to Raw and SmackDown, they kept it going. Now, the 2011 one was kind of questionable. Due to the fact that for the first time ever in the draft lottery's history, and ironically, in the last night of, in the last night of the draft lottery, as a part of the brand extension, because the brand extension was basically not so branded anymore, uh, basically what happened was John Cena, and this is where a lot of people felt that the draft lottery wasn't exactly as legit as they thought it was, because John Cena ended up being drafted over to SmackDown to open the show, and then, at the end of the night, was drafted back to Raw. So essentially, what they had established there was, in the eyes of the fans, the draft lottery wasn't as legit as they thought it was, but even if that's not the case, they basically established that, hey, you could be drafted over to one show during the night, but you might be drafted, but that also makes you eligible to get drafted back to your old show. So let's take, for example, when Bobby Lashley beat Chris Benoit. Bobby Lashley, Chris Benoit, all right? Chris Benoit goes from SmackDown to ECW. Now, let's say, I can't, I gotta uh, rewatch the, the event, but let's say during that time, or during that night, a SmackDown guy beat a ECW guy, or a Raw guy. He would be, or an ECW guy, essentially, Benoit would have been eligible to go right back to SmackDown. So, the question is, though, the question is, though, that since Shane McMahon has come back, and now this whole rumor of a brand extension happening again, is will we have another draft lottery, will we have a draft lottery for the first time in five years? Well, if any of the rumors are true, then I wouldn't be surprised. But here's the question. Who would you essentially draft to each show to kind of help them establish, firmly establish themselves as a top guy or diva? Who, top guy, diva, or team? Who would you establish? What would the rules be? Well, the way I look at it is like this. The Tag Team Championship and the Divas Championship, I truly believe, unless they really start to focus more on the Divas division, I think the Divas title and the Tag Team titles, just like back when the draft, lottery, the draft first began, the brand extension first began, I think those two should be the exception. They should be. And with those two being the exceptions, well, basically the Tag Team Champions and the Divas Champion can go between both shows. I also look at like this. One, I definitely think that if you're going to do a brand extension, you've got to bring back the World Heavyweight Championship. Either that, or if you're going to elevate a mid-card title to almost main event status, I would say take the Intercontinental Championship and make it the championship of SmackDown. Because think about it, Intercontinental and World are essentially the same thing. I'm just saying. So to me, I would either re I would either reinstate the World Heavyweight Title back, so it would be something for SmackDown to have, or like I said, I would elevate finally the Intercontinental Championship and make it my World Championship on SmackDown. Because essentially, as I said, both are basically the same thing. But what else would I do with a brand extension? What other championships would I put over there? Or keep on certain brands? Well, if you're going to either... Now, depending on whether or not SmackDown, if they're run by Triple H and Stephanie, like rumors are talking about, 
wants to establish themselves with their own champion and either elevate the Intercontinental title to that main event world title status or they reinstate the World Heavyweight Championship, the other championship I think they should take over there is the United States title. Hear me out. Let's say they decide to become, let's say they decide to reinstate the World Heavyweight title. The U.S. title would be the perfect secondary championship for people to fight over. In a sense, you'd be kind of achieving what should have been done 15 years prior, and that's having an almost WCW brand. Almost. For Monday Night Raw, you cannot remove the WWE World Heavyweight Championship. You got to keep it on Raw. You got to keep it there. You also got to keep it with the Intercontinental title as well, because those two titles were essentially a, have essentially been part of Raw since the very beginning. So you got to keep them there. And like I said, with the Divas and the tag titles, give them that same treatment that you gave the women's and the undisputed title idol back in 2002. Make them eligible for both shows. Make them exclusive to both shows. Now, you might say, okay, that's fine, but you need that, you need that third tier title to kind of keep people busy. That's what made these shows good. Because if you take a look at Raw and SmackDown during the brand extension, you know, they, you know, Raw, you know, SmackDown had the Cruiserweight title. The Hardcore Championship at a time was exclusive to, to SmackDown, but then went back to Raw for some reason. But anyway, I think because of a deal negotiation or something, I'm not really sure. But the Cruiserweight title was a secondary championship for a lot of the smaller guys that were in that Cruiserweight contention. The U.S. title was that secondary championship, their Intercontinental title. Now, on the Raw side of things, true, they kind of messed things up a little bit because they decided, hey, let's... Storyline-wise, let's retire these championships and show that Raw is going to be different by having only one title, except for the tag titles. Uh, they brought the Intercontinental title back, but that was about it. If they were to bring back a third-tier championship, I think no doubt you would have to bring back the European championship, or I go with what Brian Zane said. I would actually create a new championship, and I think after seeing what John Cena did to help elevate the uh, United States Championship, I think, in my opinion, I would bring back the television title. I would, and you can even make it the HD TV chip, the HD title, the high definition title, or the network title, <coughs> whatever it is. But I would bring back some kind of television championship. That way you have a third tier championship that equals out to what SmackDown would have. Now, as far as stars and divas, superstars and divas being on both shows, well, if you're going to firmly establish Roman Reigns as your future face of your company, at least until John Cena gets back from injury, then you have to keep Roman Reigns on Raw. You got to do that. Now, of course, you got to equal that out with someone just as popular, well, not popular, but just as polarizing or popular or whatever, just as reactionary, I should put, I should say, as Roman Reigns. And I think the person that you should put over on the face of the blue brand to be just as reactionary, and I might get some flack for this, you have to put AJ Styles. Hear me out. WWE has invested a lot in AJ to the point that instead of letting him do NXT, he's now just a main, he's basically a main roster guy working on almost an upper mid card to low main event level. Or mid main event, low to main, low to mid main event level, but on an upper mid card level. Like I said, upper mid card to low to mid main event level with guys like Chris Jericho. So I think, in a sense, that if you're going to, uh, if you're going to do this, if you're going to make the face of some, make the somebody the face of your brand, I would go with AJ Styles. I would, because I think 
you put a lot of, you invest a lot of money in him you let him skip up to the main roster i would invest it there and in a sense you're making smackdown the future of wwe you're making it exactly what it, wwe needs to be on the raw side how do you what kind of cast of characters do you give someone like roman reigns well i think if you're going to plan to either turn roman reigns heel or not you got to put him you got to put someone like you got to have a strong cast behind him so there's no doubt you got to have john cena there i hate to say it you got to have john cena there i think also you got to have dean ambrose that would be to your top three right there now i would also say that this would be the best opportunity to disband the league of nations or at least disband them split them apart to where you have representatives on both shows so i think from a League of Nations standpoint, you should have someone like a Sheamus and a Rusev. That's who I think right there should be out of the League of Nations. Now, as far as up-and-comers go, I would definitely put, as far as up-and-comers go, I would keep Sami Zayn on there. I would. Here's why. You take Kevin Owens... And you place them on SmackDown. So I would keep Sami Zayn there. I would keep I would uh, I would keep Sami Zayn. I would take someone like Sin Cara, Hunico, if you will. I'd move him over to SmackDown along with Callisto. So I'd move him there. I'd keep Neville on Raw. I take the Dudleys, and if you're finally going to go with the Bully Ray, no, the Bubba Ray slash Bully Ray concept, or the Bully Ray concept, or sort of the Bully Ray concept for Bubba Ray, then I would take Bubba Ray, put him on SmackDown, and I'd keep Devon on Raw. I know that sounds crazy. I would do that. Um, and then you got all these other things. Now, the Divas, that's an interesting aspect. You know that if you're going to make the Divas Championship exclusive to both shows, you got to have strong contenders and faces for both shows. So to me, I think for Raw, you got to keep Sasha there, and SmackDown, you got to put Becky there. End of story. And then for the cast of characters, I would say take Naomi, keep her on Raw, put Tamina on SmackDown, take Lana, keep her on Raw because Rusev there. Take Emma Ray, put her on SmackDown, and since you got Emma back, put Emma on Raw. Paige, you take Paige, you put her to SmackDown. And then if Bree's still around, I would close out her career on Raw. That's what I would do. That's what I would do with her. And Natalia, I'd probably put her on SmackDown. Now, for any of the guys coming up from NXT, that would be an interesting situation. Where would you put some of these guys coming up from NXT? Well, if I'm WWE and I'm getting ready to debut a tag team like Enzo and Cass, I put Enzo and Cass on SmackDown. I hate to say that. Put them on SmackDown because you know if Triple H is going to be there, he's, they're going to be treated better. If I'm going to finally bring up the VOD villains, <coughs> I put them on Raw. That's what I do. If I'm going to bring up another tag team, now if I'm going to bring up some single individuals, Baron Corbin, no doubt, you got to put him on SmackDown. No doubt. Samoa Joe, you put him on Raw. No doubt about that. No doubt about that. You put Samoa Joe on Raw, Baron Corbin on SmackDown. Finn Balor, if you're going to bring in the Balor Club, they got to go straight to Raw. Because that's the best way to put make an impact. Um, Austin Aries, if he's ever brought up, he's got to go to SmackDown. That's how I look at it. That's how I look at it. I'm not trying to say that's. I'm not trying to say. I'm, try, I'm not trying to say that that's what they should do. But in my opinion, I think that's the best logical option out there for them to do. And, and you know, some and some of you may may disagree with me, but that's how I look at it. 
you know, so I would do that. Now, as far as the NXT women, Bailey, I think, has to go to Smack, has to, Bailey, that's a tough one. But I say if you're going to ever put her in a feud, maybe in the future with Stephanie, because that's what some people would like to see, you got to put her on SmackDown. You got to do that. Asuka, you're going to bring her up eventually. Put her on Raw because she's good. A lot of people say she's good. Put her there. Dana Brooke, put her on SmackDown. Uh, Athena, if she's still part of NXT and still part of WWE at the time, which I think she will be, she's got to go to Raw. If you give, give her enough time, but as soon as she's ever brought in, put her on Raw. Nia Jax and Eva Marie, they got to go to SmackDown. That's how I look at it. And, and it's the truth. I'm not trying to I'm not trying to lie about that or anything. I just think that's the best option for them. I really think it is. I really think it is because when when one thinks about it, you know, when when one thinks about it, it's the best option, especially if SmackDown. Uh, is going to be taped a lot and you know they edit things obviously it's the best way to kind of edit out or maybe mask maybe some botches or moves or, or whatever so I think I think that's the best I think that's the best thing to do now as far as announcers go well, there's no doubt you got to put Michael Cole back on Raw. I mean, not back on Raw, but you got to put Michael Cole back on SmackDown. You got to take Mark Ruffalo, I think that's his name, put him on Raw. Okay. And then maybe take Byron Saxton, make him a SmackDown guy to be along Jerry Law. Basically, you take the Raw crew, Byron Saxton, and JBL and Michael Cole, you move them to SmackDown, you take Jerry Lawler, Mark Ruffalo, and let's say throw in Corey Graves, if you want to bring in an, an extension, put them put them on, uh, on, on SmackDown. That's what I would do. I mean, on Raw, I should say. That's what I would do. But if you want to bring Raw back to a two-man team, two-man announced team, then just Mark Ruffalo and Jerry Lawler best thing to do in my opinion in my opinion okay i'm not saying it's their opinion i'm not saying this or any I'm not saying it's other people's opinion it's my opinion but i think that's the best thing announcing wise if you want to change up the commentary team like i said you got to take mark ruffalo put him on raw put michael cole back on smackdown maybe put may, maybe test out mark ruffalo with jbl and byron saxton and then maybe put Michael Cole and Jerry Lawler back together and see what happens there. Um, and then I think maybe if you want to keep that three-man team, I think you should add in. I think you should add in Corey Graves as as that third man on the SmackDown side. I, I really do. Then again, then again. You know, uh, Deluxe Man says Corey Graves and T Tom Phillips are killing it on on uh, NXT right now. So if I was WWE, I would take Corey Graves and I would take him, replace Byron Saxton with him on Raw, and put Byron Saxton on SmackDown with Michael Cole and Jerry Lawler, or just like I say, move the entire Raw announced team to SmackDown, and then take Lawler and Rufio, Rufalo, put them on Raw. From SmackDown, take them from SmackDown, put them on Raw, and then add Corey Graves into the mix. I think that I think that could work out very well. So, you know that that that's the way I look at a possible brand, you know, extension happening. Um, um, if it does. You know, that, that, that's the way I look at it happening uh, if it does. So,
Yeah, like I said, um, Adrian Reese, Athena, like I mentioned, if she's still part of the WWE and NXT, which I hopefully she will be, uh, I would put her, like I said, on Raw because from what people have said, she's very talented and that's a good place for her to be uh, seen. So, uh, anyway, though, that's, that's basically what I think should happen. Again, uh, basically, that's what I think should happen with, with a possible 2016 brand extension slash draft in WWE. So, let me know what you guys think. Sorry this video went a little long. I wanted to give you guys a bit of an extension history. Wanted to give you, I wanted to give some of you guys that might be new to it, new to this concept in WWE, a kind of an extensive, extensive, extensive history on what what this draft lottery, this WWE draft and draft lottery, uh, has been and was about, and probably will be again. So, uh, let me know what you guys think down below. Comment if you like, and I will talk to y'all later.